Hello, and welcome to the Dynatrace fourth quarter in fiscal year 2021 earnings call and webcast. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to turn the call over to Noelle Farris, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Great, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Dynatrace's fourth quarter and fiscal year 2021 earnings conference call. With me on the call today are John Van Sicklin, Chief Executive Officer, and Kevin Burns, Chief Financial Officer. Before we get started, please note that today's comments include forward-looking statements, including statements regarding revenue and earnings guidance. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, and involve a number of factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by such statements. Additional information concerning these factors is contained in Dynatrace's filing with the SEC, including our annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly reports on Form 10-Q. The forward-looking statements included in this call represent the company's views on May 12, 2021, Dynatrace disclaims any obligation to update these statements to reflect future events or circumstances. As a reminder, we will be referring to some non-GAAP financial measures during today's call. A detailed reconciliation of GAAP and non-GAAP measures can be found on the Investor Relations section of our website. And with that, let me turn the call over to our Chief Executive Officer, John Van Sicklin. John? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am pleased to report that we had another quarter of strong execution, meeting guidance across all our key operating metrics. ARR was $774 million, up 35% year over year. Subscription revenue was $183 million, an increase of 35% year over year. And unlevered fee cash flow was $86 million for the quarter, bringing full-year unlevered free cash flow to $237 million, or 34% of revenue. These continued strong results were driven by the ongoing combination of solid new logo additions to the Dynatrace platform, the ongoing expansion of existing customers, and an inherently efficient business model, allowing us to deliver a sustained balance of growth and profitability. Encouragingly, we're starting to see signs of stabilization in the vertical markets most heavily impacted by the pandemic. These previously challenged verticals are once again investing in their digital transformation journeys. Our ability to successfully navigate through this past year is a testament to the resilience of our value proposition, our commitment to customer success, and our incredible team. I wanna take a moment to thank them our 2,800 employees worldwide for their focus, diligence, and teamwork throughout this past fiscal year. Their talent, attitude, and customer-first mindset are key to what makes Dynatrace such a unique and strong company. With the strength of our Q4 and year-end results as a baseline and solid outlook and fundamentals to build on as we go forward, we will be setting guidance for fiscal 2022, which Kevin will provide more detail on shortly. This morning, I'd like to discuss four topics that I believe provide a proper backdrop for continued success in fiscal 22 and beyond. First, a brief reflection on our past two years as a public company and the track record we built. Second, the powerful combination of new logos and consistent expansion across our customer base, our building blocks for sustained growth at scale. Third, our progress in go-to-market and commercial expansion initiatives underpinning these building blocks for growth. And fourth, the acceleration of our continuous innovation for sustained competitive differentiation and value in this evolving market. Let me start with a brief look back over these past two years as a public company. Two years ago, we said we'd transition our customer base smoothly and efficiently from what we called classic product to the new Dynatrace platform. Today, 
99% of ARR is on the new platform. We said we transition to a predictable high growth subscription business. Today, 93% of our revenue is subscription with strong growth in the mid 30% range year over year. We said our platform was highly differentiated, a powerful combination of best in class observability infused with AI ops automation capabilities, ideally suited to dynamic modern cloud use cases. The addition of nearly 1,200 new logos to the franchise over the past two years is proof that these capabilities and our unique value proposition are resonating with customers. And we said we would sustain a durable balance of growth and profitability. And in fact, we've done that. A rule of 60 for the last three years, including the last two as a public company, when combining ARR growth and unlevered free cash flow margin. It's been a solid start. We believe we delivered on our promises and built a predictable track record of success. A $774 million ARR business today with line of sight to a billion dollar business in the not too distant future. With a solid foundation in place, this leads me to the second topic, our building blocks for sustainable success. The powerful compounding effect of new logos and net expansion across our customer base. During fiscal 2021, we increased our Dynatrace customer base by over 20% and ARR per customer by over 15%. The compounding effect of these two resulted in total ARR growth of 35% year over year. It's this consistent addition of new logos while at the same time increasing ARR per customer that we believe provides Dynatrace the opportunity to maintain 30 plus percent growth over the long term. Specifically in Q4, we added 173 new logos to the franchise, up 19% year over year. New logo lands included Amica Insurance, Pan Airlines, Frontier Communications, and Harrods Limited. We continue to see cloud-first digital transformations accelerate globally and across all industries and governments as software and applications become critical to how services are provided and revenue is driven. As we've said, underpinning digital transformation are dynamic multi-clouds. These environments can seem simple at first, but when cloud-native workloads hit the cloud platform, as dynamic container orchestration kicks in at scale, and as DevOps teams accelerate the frequency of change, complexity ensues. And at some point, this complexity becomes overwhelming and intelligent automation becomes essential. It's this complexity wall, as some of our customers refer to it, that enables Dynatrace to enter any modern cloud environment and add significant value ease of scaling, faster innovation, lower risk, and consistent success as cloud reach and impact increases at scale. On the expansion front, in Q4, we once again achieved a net expansion rate of over 120%. The 12th consecutive quarter, we've achieved this result. Customers such as J.P. Morgan Chase, Pfizer, the European Commission, Cigna and DHL expanded their Dynatrace footprints to simplify and accelerate their digital transformations. We continue to believe most of our customers are still in the 15 to 20% range of instrumented applications, with three to four times more applications targeted for full stack observability. This alone provides us plenty of opportunity to continue expanding in tier one and two applications, our bread and butter. And add to this the significant cross-sell opportunity across what are now five additional modules beyond full stack APM with the recent addition of cloud automation and cloud app security. And you can see why we believe we can achieve an average ARR per customer of greater than a million dollars over time. In fact, customers who are using three plus modules today have an average ARR of nearly $500,000, almost two times our customer average of $260,000. This brings me to the third topic for this morning, commercial expansion. Given the powerful market trends, our high value differentiation and an expanding platform with multiple monetizable modules, 
commercial expansion continues to be a huge focus for us. I'm very pleased to see our progress back to healthy sales and marketing spend levels, again in the mid-30s as a percent of revenue. As we've discussed, we are investing in a combination of direct sales team expansion, cloud partner ecosystem expansion, and marketing-driven opportunity generation. I'm pleased to report that over the last 12 months, we were able to increase our quota carrying sales reps by 25% year over year, and are targeting to step up quota carrier expansion to the 30% range here in fiscal Q1 and for the balance of the year. In addition, we continue to fuel our cloud partnerships, both cloud SIs and strategic tech partner alliances. Cloud SI influence is now up to over 40% of our transactions worldwide. These are regional and global cloud SIs responsible for ecosystem integration of cloud platforms, such as AWS, Azure, and GCP, with container orchestration from IBM OpenShift or VMware Tenzu. Dynatrace's intelligent automation, wide and deep observability coverage, and pre-built extensions for easier implementation make it an ideal platform for these cloud SIs to leverage for any combination of modern cloud transformation. Also, in Q4, we continued our go-to-market progress with the three big hyperscalers, AWS, Microsoft, and Google. During the quarter, dozens of joint customers transacted with us through marketplace offers across these three hyperscalers as they looked to leverage cloud spend and simplify their procurement processes. And as we continue building strong go-to-market relationships, we're also expanding our technical fit into new areas. For example, with AWS, we recently added AI ops competency credentials to our containers, DevOps, and cloud migration competencies. We believe being the first and only observability platform to have added AI ops credentials will help us to continue to differentiate our offerings in the minds of the ever-expanding AWS community. In addition, a marketing progress should not be overlooked. It's the fuel for brand awareness and opportunity generation and we've intensified our investment here over the past several quarters. Having 28,000 registered attendees for our February user conference perform, 40% more than I projected at the end of January, was a massive hit. Expect to see ongoing investments in marketing to fuel sales and partner expansion as we go forward. This brings me to the fourth and final topic I wanted to cover today, the sustainability of our innovation engine. As many of you have witnessed, this is a dynamic market, ever-changing, always evolving, littered with companies who could not see around the corner and keep up. I am proud to say Dynatrace has stood the test of time and not only succeeded when others have faltered, but has actually thrived on disruptive change. We believe Gartner's recent 2021 APM Magic Quadrant is a perfect example APM is the high ground for any observability conversation. It's where the business meets IT. In this critical area, Dynatrace has been a leader 11 consecutive times, and once again this year, we lead in both completeness of vision and ability to execute. Through multiple market shifts and changing competitive dynamics, Dynatrace has adapted, anticipated, and thrived. Here are several recent examples of this innovation engine in action. In February, we announced a new cloud automation module to our platform. The cloud automation module enables DevOps teams to continuously deliver high quality code and innovation faster with more consistency and greater efficiency. This module brings intelligent, automatic closed loop remediations to critical DevOps processes, an important step toward autonomous cloud operations. Also in February, we announced enhanced log analytics support with discovery and analysis of cloud platform logs from AWS, Azure, Google, and Kubernetes, as well as open source logs such as Fluent and Logstash. Now customers can extend visibility in cloud native environments and begin consolidating their log use cases and spend into Dynatrace, gaining both efficiency and lower costs. And this past quarter, we announced advanced GDPR functionality and session replay for mobile to our digital experience module. These capabilities provide important global and technical expansion to drive DEM adoption 
further and faster across more customer applications than ever before. Leveraging a combination of our proven approach, a highly talented R&D team, and the rapid growth in engineering talent that mirrors the pace of growth of the company itself, we are confident our innovation engine will continue to drive high value, highly differentiated capabilities across both platform and modules well into the future. With that, let me summarize. These past two years have been fantastic, capped off with a great Q4 and year end to our fiscal 2021. We've invested in the building blocks for sustained high growth to drive the compounding combination of new logos and continuous ARR expansion across our growing base. We've proven our ability to execute through challenging times and in a rapidly evolving market. And we have delivered on our promise of a balanced approach to growth and profitability, sustaining a rule of 60 business for the past three years. With that, let me turn it over to Kevin to take us into our financial results and guidance. Kevin. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. As John mentioned, we delivered another great quarter across the board, driven by strong ARR performance well above our guidance range. The Dynatrace team has done a tremendous job executing in a challenging year. As you know, we believe ARR is a key performance metric of the overall strength and health of the business. ARR was up $201 million over last year, ending the fiscal year at $774 million. This represents 35% year-over-year growth or 32% in constant currency. Excluding the perpetual license headwind, which negatively impacted ARR by $19 million, or three percentage points, our adjusted ARR growth rate was 38% on an as-reported basis and 35% on a constant currency basis. As we have communicated, the building blocks for ARR growth continued to be the combination of new logos and our net expansion rate. We continued to see momentum in new logo additions exceeding our expectations from a few quarters ago and well above the 9% growth rate last quarter. We added 173 new logos in the fourth quarter, representing 19% growth over the 145 new logos we added in Q4 of last year. We ended the year with more than 2,900 Dynatrace customers. Our net expansion rate was above 120% for the 12th consecutive quarter, and our ARR per Dynatrace customer increased to $260,000, up 17% year over year. Our average ARR per customer with three or more modules continues to increase. This cohort represented 35% of our customers in the fourth quarter, up from 27% last year. As a result, we now have over 1,000 customers with three or more modules, an increase of almost 400 customers over last year, and it is noteworthy that these customers have an average ARR of nearly $500,000 per customer. As John said, we believe that as more and more customers adopt new modules and expand coverage, the average ARR per enterprise customer can be north of $1 million. Moving on to revenue, total revenue for the fourth quarter was $197 million, $5 million above the high end of our guidance and representing an increase of 31% on a year-over-year basis or 27% in constant currency. The strength in total revenue growth is being driven by 35% growth in subscription revenue or 32% in constant currency. Overall, revenue came in nicely above guidance due to the strength in new logos and a solid net expansion rate, both driven by better sales productivity. With respect to margins, total non-GAAP gross margin for the fourth quarter was 85%, in line with last quarter and up two percentage points from Q4 of last year. We saw an expansion in our gross margin driven by cost savings related to the pandemic combined with the benefits of our efficient Dynatrace platform. Our non-GAAP operating income for the fourth quarter was $49 million, $3 million above the high end of our guidance due to the revenue upside and associated gross margin expansion. This led to a non-GAAP operating margin of 25%, up one percentage point from the fourth quarter of last year. 
Non-GAAP net income was $43 million or 15 cents per share. This is a penny above the high end of our guidance due to the favorable revenue upside. Turning to a quick summary of the financial results for the full year, total revenue was $704 million, $5 million above our guidance range, and up 29% year over year, or 28% in constant currency. Total revenue growth is being driven by the underlying growth in subscription revenue, which was $655 million, $3 million above the high end of our guidance, representing an increase of 34% year over year, and 33% in constant currency. Non-GAAP operating income for the year was $207 million, above the high end of our guidance, resulting in a non-GAAP operating margin of 29%, up from 24% in fiscal 20. As we've mentioned in the past, we believe in a balanced approach to operating the business, one that delivers strong and durable performance on both the top line and bottom line. And as John mentioned earlier, our strategy to invest in strategic areas to support the long-term growth of the business is the right one. While we ended fiscal 21 with 500 basis points of non-GAAP operating margin leverage compared to fiscal 20, a large portion of this leverage was driven by COVID-related savings that we worked prudently throughout the course of fiscal 21 to reinvest back into the business to further support growth. Turning to the balance sheet, as of March 31st, we had $325 million of cash, an increase of $112 million over last year. Our long-term debt was $392 million at the end of Q4. Our gross debt was down $120 million over last year and down $60 million sequentially due to a principal repayment that we made earlier in the fourth quarter. In addition, we made another repayment of $30 million during the month of April further reducing our debt balance to about $362 million. We are extremely pleased with our ability to generate cash while at the same time significantly increasing our investment levels in the business. As we have shared in the past, we committed to reducing our outstanding debt and improving our leverage ratio, and I am pleased to report that we have delivered. Our unlevered free cash flow for Q4 was solid at $86 million. For the full year, our unlevered free cash flow was $237 million, or 34% of revenue. This margin level is above our previous unlevered free cash flow margin guidance of 32% of revenue due to the combination of strength of ARR, stronger collections, and some other working capital improvements. The last financial measure that I would like to mention is our remaining performance obligation, which at the end of the quarter was approximately $1.2 billion, an increase of 38% over Q4 of last year. The current portion of RPO, which we expect to recognize as revenue over the next four quarters, was $684 million, also an increase of 38% year over year. As I've mentioned in the past, we believe AR is the best metric to remove billings and contracting noise, but we do provide RPO as we believe over time it will become a more meaningful metric. Now let me turn to guidance. Again, our key financial metric to understanding the business momentum is ARR and the building blocks to AR growth, our new logos, and our net expansion rate. We believe the investments we are making in commercial expansion and product innovation will enable us to sustain 15 to 20% new logo growth and maintain 120% net, net expansion rate for fiscal 22. From a guidance standpoint, ARR is expected to be between $975 and $990 million, up 26 to 28% year over year, or 25 to 27% in constant currency. Our AR guidance assumes three to four percentage points of headwind to AR growth in fiscal 22 due to the headwind associated with the perpetual license wind down. We expect it will be at the higher end of that range for the first three quarters and then drop to 3% in Q4. At the end of the year, we believe perpetual license will be down to one to one and a half percent of total ARR. 
which will essentially end the perpetual license transition and associated AR headwind. Excluding the perpetual license headwind, our full year adjusted AR growth rate is expected to be between 28% to 30% year over year on a constant currency basis. Wrapping up our AR discussion, as we have outlined in the past, our business is not linear from quarter to quarter with a fair amount of seasonal strength in the back half of the year, with Q3 being our strongest quarter, followed by Q4. We do expect quarterly AR expansion seasonality to be consistent with what we saw last year. Total revenue for the full year is expected to be $885 to $900 million, a 26 to 28% year over year, or 24 to 26% in constant currency. Underlying that, subscription revenue is expected to be between $834 and $848 million, up 27% to 29% year over year, or 25 to 27% in constant currency. As discussed, we, we expect subscription revenue to be 94% of total revenue driven by the size and strength of AR and associated subscription revenue growth. Moving down to P&L, we expect full year non-GAAP operating income to be between 203 and $216 million. From an investment standpoint, we are focused on the long-term growth of the business. We believe the proper levels of spend for sales and marketing to be in a range of 34 to 36% of revenue and R&D to be around 15% of revenue. This result is a non-GAAP operating margin of 23 to 24% for the year. For the full year, we expect non-GAAP EPS of 59 to 62 cents per share based on 292 to 293 million diluted shares outstanding. Our non-GAAP net income and non-GAAP EPS calculations assume a non-GAAP effective cash tax rate of 12%. We believe utilizing an annual non-GAAP effective cash tax rate reduces quarterly variability. A recast of the first three quarters of our fiscal 21 quarterly results is available in the financial tables in today's press release and also reflects a non-GAAP effective cash tax rate of approximately 8%, which was used throughout fiscal 20. At these investment levels, we are able to deliver very solid unlevered free cash flow margins. For the year, we expect unlevered free cash flow margin to be approximately 29 to 30% of revenue, which is 256 to $268 million. Looking at Q1, we expect total revenue to be between 202 and $204 million, up 30 to 31% year over year, or 25 to 26 percent in constant currency. Subscription revenue is expected to be between 190.5 and 192 million dollars, up 32 to 33 percent year over year, or 27 to 28 percent on a constant currency basis. From a profit standpoint, non-GAAP operating income is expected to be between 49 and 51 million dollars, 24 to 25 percent of revenue and non-GAAP EPS of 14 to 15 cents per share. In summary, we are very pleased with our fourth quarter in fiscal 21 performance, where we st saw strong ARR and top-line growth combined with healthy margins. We remain excited about the growth opportunity with a line of sight to $1 billion in ARR. This is another important milestone and further enhanced by being one of the few software companies operating at a rule of 50 plus. To wrap up, we have a solid position in the growing market, strong product differentiation, and a compelling value proposition that we believe will help us maintain top line growth well into the future. At the same time, we also have a consistent track record of making the right strategic investments to maintain healthy margins and cash flow. Overall, we believe we are well positioned for sustained and durable growth in fiscal 22 and beyond. And with that, we'll open the line for questions. Operator? 
Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to be placed into question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing star 1. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question today is coming from Bhavan Suri from William Blair. Your line is now live. Thanks, everybody, and uh, congratulations. That was just a, a strong, strong finish there. Um, I guess I, I want to touch a little on the sales investment and the partner investment, um, and, and maybe this is for, for John here, but, but as you think about it, you're accelerating sales investments to 30% growth in, in headcount. You're increasing the partner investment. Um, I'd love to understand how you're balancing the two, because obviously one feels more profitable than the other one, and the partners do the pushing of the sales process, and you're brought in kind of at the end. And then the second piece is, is how does that drive? Because that, that to me, 30% growth in sales plus partners means that you know, potentially ARR could grow well more than 30%. So I'd love to understand how you think about that. Sure, Bravon, and uh, thank you for the comments there. Um, so the uh, the combination of investments, they really do go hand in hand. Um, we don't look at uh, what partners as necessarily a separate channel. We see it as an augmentation uh, to our go-to-market approach, whether they're the ones that you know source an opportunity or we do. Uh, we work hand in hand to make sure that we do sort of the, 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 the right thing for our customer base. Remember, our customer base are the largest companies on the planet, billion-dollar-plus companies, so they pretty much always have someone in there helping them with their digital transformation. So we see it uh, sort of hand-in-glove and the combination actually driving greater momentum and productivity for our sales organization. And, and you're right in that you know, if we do our job right and we execute, you know, well, that we have uh, an accelerant, you know, ahead of us. You know, it's yet to, yet to uh, 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 pay off in that manner, but uh, we're working hard at it and uh, see some great opportunity ahead. Understood. And just Understood. To, I appreciate that call. It, yep. Oh, sorry, Bavon. Just to jump in, right, in terms of the, the tailwind to productivity as we think about the next couple of years, as, as you mentioned, there's the 30% quota capacity, there's the partner program, which we're investing in, which is great. We're, we've also came off a conversion program, and I think this is the first quarter where we saw some tangible results there. And also, you know, something we've talked about historically as well is the maturing of the sales organization. And we've seen that a nice improvement over the last 12, 18, 24 months of, you know, reps that have been here for a longer period of time, which we believe can, hire, can, can deliver higher productivity over time. So all those, we believe, are, are good tailwinds to the business and, uh, you know, can just support long-term sustainable AR growth. That's, that's really helpful. I, I want to follow up on that, but, but I had a question for, um, uh, for you guys about the service now relationship. If you want to share the productivity improvements, that'd be great. <laughs> but I do want to focus on service now. Service now, where you've had a great partnership, and you know, obviously, you do a ton of work for uh, Bill McDermott's other company when he was at previously, um, where you're instrumental in, in supporting that. They enter the observability space. So I just want to give you a thought and sort of does that change the relationship? How are you thinking about that? Um, what does that mean? Because that was a great sort of somewhat unique partnership you have with ServiceNow. You know, it's a, it's, it's a good question and, and I'm sure a timely question on, on people's minds. Um, our relationship with ServiceNow has really been in the field with joint customers. And those joint customers, um, you know, need our platforms to work extremely well together and and that's where our focus has been and that's what sort of you know pulled us pulled us together um, the fact that they've you know added uh, a little bit of sort of observability of you know sort of a future piece part tool you know makes sense for them you know they need to be relevant inside clouds they're outside looking in at the moment um, so it, it makes sense that they would try to you know, get into a conversation they're not in yet. But um, as far as, you know, our relationship, our platform is much larger uh, and much more strategic to customers than sort of a piece part add-on. Uh, so I don't really see, you know, any change to the relationship 
uh, with ServiceNow uh, in the field, you know, as we go forward. Great. Great. Thank you, Jensen. Congrats. Uh, again, solid results. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Raymond Lenshaw from Barclays. Your line is now live. Uh, thank you, and congrats from me as well. Um, on a slightly uh, similar topic, uh, John, um, you mentioned the Magic Quadrant, and it's really nice to see how you guys kind of move more onto the top right and are kind of distinct yourself from the other guys. Um, but you also saw, like, some of the newer entrants kind of coming up there. Can you just, for our benefit, just to, uh, help us understand a little bit, you know, where they might be playing versus you are playing in that broader space to get a, a little bit of differentiation. To me, from our checks, it seems more you're kind of winning the enterprise and someone comes more on the low end, but like, just to help me understand that a little bit better. Thank you. You know, that's, a, that, that's, that's the right observation. You know, we've, we've been clear since, you know, sort of IPO and actually, you know, years before that, that we were gonna focus uh, ourselves on what are more challenging customers, uh, bigger and more scalable, you know, problem set, uh, which we excel at. So we focus on that global 15,000 and uh, we consistently, you know, win in that world. Uh, there are other entrants that enter sort of in the departmental or SMB markets, um, some excelling, you know, in those, in those markets, but that's really, you know, quite a different, different market space. Um, in, in our world, the, the combination of observability with automation and AI assistance, you know, it's, it's a critical intersection. There is no way to deal with the volume, velocity, and, and variety of data explosion, this, this, the dynamic, you know, uh, orchestration of these, you know, multi-cloud environments, the frequency of change, you know, of multiple DevOps teams, you know, without some level, in fact, sophisticated levels of automation. And so that's really setting us apart, giving us fuel. You can see it in our numbers. You can see it in the new logo growth, the expansion growth, that that, that combination resonates with these large enterprise class customers. Uh, so we're happy with uh, where we are, where we, we appreciate, you know, Gartner's, uh, you know, um, support, you know, for, the unique value proposition that we bring to the market. And uh, we see a lot of great opportunity ahead, you know, with this combination and then continuing to fuel it, you know, as I said in my prepared remarks, with the continuous innovation engine that we have uh, that's just rolling along like crazy right now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then one, one follow-up, um, and more for Kevin maybe. As we start a new year, like, uh, and you, your investments are increasing on the sales and marketing side, et cetera. Uh, anything we should be aware of in terms of sales, sales structure as the new year starts to kind of, you know, get more the logo driven or, you know, ch change the sales force a little bit, anything on that side? Thank you. No, we, <clears throat> we've been doing some, some minor adjustments along the way, but at the end of the day, we're an enterprise sales organization with a named account strategy, and that will be complemented by our partner program as well. So, um, our goal is, you know, just making sure we're hiring at all levels of the organizations, from the VPs to the RDs, down to the account account executives, and scaling these things out uh, globally. So, no, no, no fundamental changes. It's more of the same, uh, albeit at a bit uh, at a at a faster clip. Hopefully, going into fiscal 22 here. Perfect. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Gray Powell from BTIG. Your line is now live. Great, thanks for uh, taking the question and congratulations on the uh, strong results. Um, Thank you. So, so yeah, maybe, maybe starting off on just sort of the obvious side. I mean, you all had a, a very good fiscal 21. Uh, I think you beat your initial ARR guidance by over 10%. Uh, at, at the same time, you talked about how 15 to 20% of your business was from highly exposed industries. So is it possible to quantify what you think was the headwind from COVID um, even if it's just a ballpark number last year, and then and then how should we think about you know the slope of recovery within those that that that, that impacted customer cohort? Thanks. Sure, Kevin. Why don't I start? And if you want to put any you know a little bit of quant on it, because we have quanted it a little bit during the year. Um, so from a you know the challenge verticals you know were 
you know, they were they were more challenged in the first half than the second half. And, and as I and as I said in, in my remarks, we're starting to see you know a, a recovery of those verticals as they prepare for uh, you know sort of uh, reemergence you know into uh, into growth verticals you know going forward. And um, you know with that, software is one of the first things everyone invests in to make sure they're the most efficient, most agile, and most scalable, you know, they can be. Last thing they want is a, is a fumble, you know, on their sort of reemergence from, from uh, the pandemic. So uh, that's what we're starting to see. It's, very, it's encouraging. And uh, we look forward to having a, a full set of global verticals and, and governments, you know, investing in digital transformation in uh, 22 and beyond. Kevin, any quant you want to add? Yeah, just in terms of our results this year, obviously, as, as John mentioned, Q2 was the strongest quarter, was the quarter where we were most heavily impacted from a COVID headwind, and that was about three to four points is the way we sort of framed that at the time. And then going into Q3, that, that number got cut in half, and, and, and going into Q4, it, it reduced as well. So, you know, there still is a little bit of a headwind, but as John says, companies are starting to ramp back up and making those investments. And, you know, we sort of think it, at this point it's somewhat immaterial in terms of a headwind to the businesses, which is why we're not breaking it out as, you know, one of those tailwinds or headwinds to growth going forward. Understood. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is coming from David Hines from Canada Cord. Your line is now live. Hey, thanks, guys. Congrats on the uh, strong results. Um, John, I wanted to ask, uh, look, obviously the plans are in place for accelerated sales investment. That's awesome. I'm going to be greedy. I'm going to ask, why not more, right? I mean, do you, do you think the market could support faster sales investments? And, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on kind of the gating factors there. Is it just about, you know, operationalizing a larger team or, or is there more to it? No, it's a great question. We ask ourselves that all the time as well. Um, but, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about this before. In order to operationalize, you know, sales expansion, you know, it, it takes a superstructure. It takes onboarding, uh, it takes, uh, you know, operations um, for sort of measurement, productivity improvement, assurance that, you know, the, the bodies you're adding are actually turning into quota capacity. And so we've stepped up from the 20% range to 25. We're now 25 to 30 uh, we uh, we see line of sight to be able to do that with the uh, investments we've made in the in the sales structure, and as well as the partnerships because that's pretty key as well. Same thing with marketing operation opportunity development. So we have the the building blocks in place that we didn't have maybe a year ago to be able to step up to 30 percent. And you know once we hit 30 and we're doing well and and scaling that, you know we'll be uh, we'll be talking about 35. Uh, yeah. So it's okay. a it's a prudent approach, I think, to uh, to scaling the the sales operation. Yeah, m makes sense. Um, and maybe I could follow up w with a different competitive question. I mean, Bavon asked about ServiceNow. I, I want to ask you about Splunk. Um, I, I know you've talked about having lots of joint customers in the past. I, I'm curious what you're hearing there as they expand into observability. I mean, uh, look, obviously, lots of work for them to do in terms of knitting the product together. But but I'm curious how you see that playing out? I mean, do you think they'll try and be price disruptive? Uh, you know, I, I know they're not a core competitor today, but we'd love any thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, we really haven't seen a change in the, uh, in the market environment or e in any of the conversations with our customers over the last really two years since they've been, you know, acquiring companies. And, um, you know, I think their recent, you know, announcements of, you know, their their observability cloud is just sort of a repackaging of what they've already been talking about. So not sure what's uh, what's going on over there and, and sort of how they're, you know, putting things together. But I will say that the customers that we talk to, and as you point out, many are sort of, you know, have, have Splunk platforms in as well. Um, they really value the automation and AI assistance that we bring because they know they have a real-time, massively scalable cloud challenge in front of them, uh, and a suite of tools is not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like our differentiation, um, you know, when, whenever, 
you know, Splunk gets sort of their focus together, you know, who knows. But uh, like I said, I think the market's moving more toward us and away from just a simple observ- observability play, certainly at the enterprise level. Yeah, very helpful. Thanks, guys, and congrats again. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Matt Hedberg from RBC. Your line is now live. Oh, hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, hey, John, you know, you know, hearing you talk about maintaining 30% growth over the long time is certainly impressive. Um, and, and I guess, you know, part of that thesis, I think, is, is continuing to, to, to kind of diversify away from APM. And, and last quarter, I think you noted 40% of your customers, or maybe nearly 40%, were using infrastructure on non-full stack workloads. I'm wondering, can, can you comment on how that might trend this year? And then I guess, you know, sort of importantly, you know, why have you been so successful cross-selling outside of, IP, uh, outside of APM? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, so there's, there's several things going on at the, at the same time that are actually helping us, giving us a little bit of a tailwind. Um, one of them is that the conversations that we're having with customers are less about APM, less about a layer, uh, and more about the whole full-stack observability, you know, approach which is perfect for us because that's what we, you know, re- rebuilt and reinvented our platform around, you know, a full stack approach. Um, logs, metrics, user experience, topology, you know, et cetera. So it's, um, uh, so it's perfect for us, perfect conversation. And I think that that's accelerating uh, the multi-module, you know, approach. Um, and uh, we'll continue to do that this year. I mean, the fact that we have 35% of our customers now with three plus modules you know, is uh, is something that I see us continuing to penetrate that customer base. You know, whether we take it to 45% or 50%, not sure this year, but it's certainly a, a, a key part of our focus. I, I think the other part of this is that once we relieved the sales organization of conversions, we were able to, you know, really step them up and focus them on cross-selling. And I think you see that you know, in, in, in the numbers this year, I mean, obviously we're maintaining a great and healthy net expansion rate. Uh, and I see that continuing, you know, as well. And with the innovation engine, adding a few more modules to the portfolio, uh, you know, that's, that's all goodness as well for, uh, for that uh, multi-module, you know, cross-selling. So I think you're going to see more of the same. The sales organization is doing a great job absorbing, you know, the, the additional functionality and customers are, are looking forward to it. I mean, the, 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 the centering of our platform around AI ops capabilities, you know, really unifies, you know, all these modules into a very powerful combination. So, um, so yeah, we look, uh, we look forward to 22 and beyond. I, we really do, uh, you know, feel like we're in a good place and, you know, we're, we're riding a lot of great, uh, you know, market momentum at this moment. So we'll keep it up. That's great. It certainly seems, yeah, it certainly seems evident to us as well. And I, and I guess, Kevin, you know, you know, you, you always do a good job of outlining sort of some of your, your building blocks assumptions for, for ARR. And, and there's been a lot of focus on, on NRR and, and obviously on, on your, kind of your, your quota, quota capacity ads this year. But, you know, I think you added about 20% uh, you grew your customer base by about 20% last year. I guess I'm one, you know, wondering sort of, you know, within your ARR guide, what, what is sort of your assumption on, on customer ads this year? Do, do you think you might, uh, you know, grow that, grow that base even more than, more than you did last year? So I, I, so I break it into two components. One is when we just look at the new logo additions, um, last year we added about 584 new logos uh, to the business. And what we talked about in, in the in the call is adding another 15 to 20 percent, and you know, frankly, we're, we're we're hopeful internally that we can overachieve that. So that that would be the on the put on the positive side to adding to the 2,900 customer base. Um, from a churn standpoint, you know, we still have a couple hundred customers who are single module, very small customers that came over over the last couple of years from from some of the con- primarily from some of the conversion programs that we did and you know if you if you add up those customers i think it's the, the total number is around 300 customers of the 2900 customers it represents less than 10 million of ar you know i think it's in that seven to eight million dollars range of ar so you know i think you will see some of that churn we will certainly try to make sure that those some those customers become platform customers. But if they don't, 
Matt, you know, we're gonna we're gonna turn those out and frankly just sort of refocus our, our energies on more what we believe would be more strategic uh, opportunities. So long way of saying you know, take the 2900, you add the new logos that we're gonna come in over uh, over the next uh, 12 months, and then there will be some churn component related to that single module, you know, non-strategic customer base that has a very low ARR component to it. So hopefully, hopefully that Got helps. It. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Congrats, congrats for me as well on the results, guys. Very strong. All right. Thank, thank you, Matt. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Andrew Nowinski from DA Davidson. Your line is now live. Great. Thank you. Um, so a couple of questions. I think you mentioned that the ARR per customer increased uh, 260000 uh, in Q4. Can you just talk about uh, maybe more specifically which modules might be driving uh, that increase? And, and um, uh, then I have a follow-up. Thanks. Sure. Well, we, we, we don't break it out every quarter, all the different you know pieces, but um, obviously we land – you know, in a full stack APM, you know, mode in the modern clouds, because you need that, that application infrastructure network, you know, logs, metric trace topology kind of combination in order to really understand how the apps are working in dynamic multi clouds. Um, so that's still the landing zone. Um, but from an expansion standpoint, it's, it's still a combination of the, the infrastructure only like extending uh, the, the Dynatrace platform beyond the full stack um, host unit environments, you know, try to get that uh, additional visibility and, and AI assistance across a wider footprint. So that's, you know, continuing to expand within our customer base and the digital experience, you know, elements as well, uh, where customers, you know, they're, the, the pandemic really forced a lot of our customers to uh, understand their remote, you know, customer pace better because they couldn't interact with them in any other way. Uh, so our digital experience business, especially the mobile, you know, application um, monitoring, you know, uh, took a big uh, tick up, you know, over last year. And we don't see that slowing down at all. So those are probably the two primary. And then we are seeing more and more, you know, uh, metric ingestion, you know, areas, whether they're uh, business metrics, with our business analytics or whether they're um, additional uh, data, you know, elements into our AI engine, uh, which are starting to fuel um, some of the uh, ingestion metrics as well. So it's actually a combination. I mean, everything's, uh, you know, working pretty well, but um, I think the infrastructure extension and the digital experience are the two primary drivers of additional modules. Super. Thanks, John. Um, and then, I know the cloud application security module is very new, but I was wondering if you could just comment on how customer adoption was of that solution uh, last quarter, and do you think that has enough features in it to see uh, a fairly significant increase in adoption this year or this coming fiscal year here, or is there more work to be done uh, before it starts to contribute? Sure. Um, so first of all, we're, we're super excited. The feedback we're getting, you know, right now is, um, you know, it, it supports our thesis. We're entering the right place. Uh, it's a greenfield space, um, and uh, there's a little more work to do in order to uh, to fill out the uh, the product for it to be enterprise ready. Um, you got to remember that our customer base are billion dollar plus companies. Uh, they're very very picky, uh, and they expect a pretty wide footprint of coverage uh, before they're willing to you know add something else to their security portfolio. But but that said. Um, we've touched about 10% of our customer base. Um, you know, everyone pretty much to the, to the company is, is thrilled that we're getting into the space, that this is a great entry point. Uh, the DevOps teams are particularly excited as they sort of pick up the DevSecOps, you know, approach. Um, so it's early, as we said, we knew we were, had a, you know, a, a, an early product that was going to need to fill out in the first half of this year but I think it's going to start to make a, an impact in the second half and definitely be a uh, ARR driver for us in fiscal 23, just as we had hoped. Great. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Sterling Alti from JP Morgan. Your line is now live. Yeah, thanks. Hi, guys. 
So you talked about, you know, a little bit of stability in the hardest hit industries, but I want to go the other way. Which industries are contributing the most at this point, and how do you see that evolving through the rest of this fiscal year? Well, I'd have to go down sort of a, you know, sort of a list uh, here and there and sort of compare, Sterling, what, uh, you know, which ones have, have, have actually ticked up as a percent. Um, and I don't think we'd notice a big, you know, up, you know, tick up or tick down from some of the stronger verticals. Uh, but there is one that sort of sticks out for us, um, which I will mention, and that is the government's. And these are governments around the world, as well as the state governments in, in, in the U.S. Um, the pandemic, you know, really changed the dynamic for government um, interaction with citizens. And it's put a lot of pressure on sort of older system approaches that need to modernize quickly to modern cloud. And we've seen an uptick you know, across state and, and, you know, national governments around the world in upgrading and digitally transforming faster their environments. And uh, so we've been investing, you know, some of our sales resources and expansion has been going into that, you know, that space around the world. And we see that that is a new augmentation, if you will. I mean, it's, it's hard to call it a vertical, but it is an, it is something relatively new for us uh, that uh, you know gives us you know great promise and continued expansion you know in the uh, in the government business. That's great. And then one follow up, Kevin, for you, can you at least qualitatively give us a bridge of how uh, we go from the operating margin in fiscal twenty one to that in twenty two? So in other words. How much of this is coming from, you know, return to business travel, some of the pickup in Teamy? How much is coming from, you know, sales and marketing expansion, as you talked about, versus other? Just so we can kind of understand the puts and takes. Yeah. So as I'm sure you can see, over the course of fiscal 21, you know, early earlier in the year, we had quite a quite a big uh, cost savings on the P&L that sort of flowed through to op income. And, you know, we were prudent about how we put, put additional money to work over the course of Q3 and Q4. And I think you, you see the result of that coming through to the P&L. And those investments were in, you know, in more R&D resources, right, getting that spend back up to 15%-ish, uh, and then getting that sales and marketing to 34 36%. And those investments in sales and marketing at this point are, are primarily the people and, and around the partner programs and, and some of the marketing programs that John talked about as well going forward. So when we think about fiscal 22, you know, there's going to be more of the same of that, right? Make, making sure we keep R&D at 15% primarily through making sure we're, we're tracking and hiring the right people, which we've been doing a great job of. Uh, and sales and marketing is going to be, it's going to be quota, you know, it's going to be direct sales organization or direct sales people more investments in the park partner program. And we do expect travel to come back online more so in the Q3, Q4 timeframe. But, you know, given the strength of the P&L and the AR and the top line growth, we can absorb that without, you know, without sacrificing, frankly, the investments that we're making in, in quota capacity, right, and driving higher quota capacity over time. So we do expect a, a rebound a little bit in terms of COVID, uh, some of the stuff we saved from COVID. But it's you know we just don't also don't think it's going to get back to normal. So it's we're pleased that those investments we're making this year are really really about the people, right? Engineers and and people in the sales organization and marketing organization to drive durable growth. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. And next question is coming from Jack Andrews from Needman Company. Your line is now live. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. I was wondering if you could just describe how your view of the um, what the opportunity is for your cloud automation module and whether you think this is largely a greenfield or a displacement opportunity, and, and how should we be thinking about the potential uh, uplift or contribution of this module relative to uh, some of the others in, in your portfolio? Yeah, great question. No, we actually see it, you know, as as a as a greenfield opportunity. Um, and 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 a 
and a continuation of, of an effort that we've had in place for a couple of years. It's, it's actually maybe more of a formalization, you know, into a product module of an effort we've had. It's been mainly a services approach to date. But we've been productizing uh, the, the modules of productization of, of some of that early services work. Um, it's targeted first at, uh, at the DevOps uh, uh, continuous deployment or de uh, uh, environments uh, and bringing, you know, auto remediation and, and automated, uh, you know, quality steps along the way uh, to ensure, you know, greater code quality, you know, consistency and efficiency, you know, as I said. Uh, so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, We've always been, you know, involved in the DevOps processes because of our code level detail that we provide, but this actually adds significant intelligent automation to the process. That said, this is the beginning of, of the uh, autonomous cloud approach. And so what we then do is we take, you know, the same approach that we're taking right now in the DevOps and extend it into cloud operations. The, the production operation environment, again, driving, you know, uh, automatic, you know, uh, remediations, you know, for, you know, for, you know, the elimination of run books. And uh, so anyway, it's a journey for us. It's a first step. Uh, we see the opportunity, you know, say, you know, if you, if you want to quant it, think of it as a 20 cents, you know, on the, uh, on the APM dollar, you know, kind of addition. And as we go, this module become more and more valuable, uh, similar to what we're doing with the security module. As we add capabilities and additional use cases, you know, will uh, you know it'll become uh, more valuable, a a as I said, within the portfolio and for our customers. So it's um, it's it's fairly early in its evolution, uh, but we're getting some great resonance with customers who have been along the services journey with us and have been looking for this level of productization so they can really scale it out within their organizations. That's really helpful commentary. Thanks, and uh, congratulations on the results. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Eric Supiger from JMP Securities. Your line is now live. Yeah, thanks for taking the question, and uh, congrats on a very solid quarter. Um, most of the questions have been asked, but I'm just curious on the infrastructure module. Can you speak to the competitive dynamics with, uh, with Datadog? Can you talk a little bit about whether you've seen any change in terms of um, uh, efforts that they're making uh, to to, uh, to compete, and uh, I presume that they are the incumbent in many of the um, accounts that you're uh, you're talking to. Talk a little bit about um, how the displacements have gone with uh, with some of those accounts. You know, well, I don't have you know lots that we haven't seen a lot of change in our sort of competitive you know dynamic with uh, with datadog um, it's a massive market and so our overlap is still quite light but what we are seeing is that uh, with our infrastructure module we're competing more with a, with a do-it-yourself approach and what I mean by that is companies with many different products and different tools you know trying to measure telemetry from all different angles uh, and just running into uh, a massive challenge. It's sort of a, a tool fatigue, if you will, uh, where, you know, it's every, every man and woman for themselves and, and no consistent uh, sort of source of truth across a wide footprint, which everyone's looking for in these modern clouds. And so when, when we extend, we, con we consolidate tooling and provide, you know, a single source of automated truth you know, for multiple different teams throughout the digital, you know, transformation and, 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 and uh, uh, process. So, um, so that's why, you know, we don't really think about competing against a data dog. I mean, they, they may be there, New Relic may be there, you know, uh, others, you know, open source tools may be there, uh, but we solve a different problem, a bigger problem uh, that is, you know, much more uh, uh, urgent for the larger customers uh, where they really, really need uh, fewer platforms. Maybe they're not going to go to one, but fewer platforms to deal with this runaway complexity that they're experiencing in, in their dynamic multi-clouds today. 
Um, so that's really the dynamic, and that's what drives, you know, and fuels our expansion. And, and that's really the dynamic we see in the market, and we're well positioned for it. Thank you. We've reached the end of our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the floor back over to management for any further closing comments. Yeah, let me just uh, let me just say thank you again for everybody who joined us uh, this morning. You know, we, we're coming off a of fantastic fiscal 21 great momentum into 22 uh, market is continuing to to uh, uh, you know market trends are continuing to be in our favor our investments are, are paying off as I think you've seen in the results and hopefully going forward in the results and I look forward to reporting in July and you know updating everybody on uh, our first step in fiscal 22 thank you very much Thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference and webcast. You may disconnect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation.